I was four years old with only primary colors in my paint box. But when I mixed them together, a rainbow of new colors shimmered like potions in my plastic cups. I dipped my paintbrush into purple, waved it across my paper like a wand, and abracadabra, a purple giraffe appeared. Art made me feel like a magician. When I learned to read, my magic powers increased. Opening a book was like slipping out of smoggy 1960s Los Angeles and through the looking glass with Alice, over the rainbow with Dorothy, into Hans Christian Andersen's worlds where everything from a fir tree to a tin soldier had a soul. The books I loved felt so real that I searched for their characters even after I'd closed their covers. Maybe Charlotte and Wilbur's barnyard was right behind that 7-Eleven. Maybe Peter Pan would fly through my window one night. Even though the story of Hansel and Gretel was terrifying, I wished I could find a gingerbread house in the forest. I never found one, but I did transform our family station wagon into a kind of gingerbread house by scotch taping Fig Newtons, Fritos, and Cheerios all over it. <laughs> After my mom made me clean up the mess, I took my pony Ginger out for a ride. Ginger was really my bike, but with the alchemy of pretend, I changed her into a galloping, whinnying pal. My childhood was one big magic show. But my favorite trick of all was to magic myself right out of the big city right out of my big family, where I was the youngest of four kids, and into a miniature world where I didn't feel small. On the shelves of my closet and in fruit crates stacked up like apartment buildings, I created a dollhouse. I'd lose myself for hours making up stories about the tiny people and animals who lived in it. I loved to make them treasures from scraps of this and that. Paper doilies would morph into lacy tablecloths, postage stamps shone like paintings on the walls. Bits of flowered cloth bloomed into a garden. Butcher paper and oil pastels became forested rolling green hills. But as I grew older, I began to have my doubts. I was turning into a teenager, but I still loved to play like a little kid. What would my older siblings think if they knew that my art projects were also my playmates, each with a name and a story? How would my friends at school feel if they knew that at home I played with imaginary friends? Why wasn't I growing up right? On the saddest, most serious day of my life, the day of my mother's funeral, a few weeks after I turned 14, I crept away into my closet-turned dollhouse. I let my bright clay people and gentle paper animals comfort me, and I felt like a total misfit too young to be motherless and too old to be making believe. E.B. White made me feel better. Because I loved his book so much, I decided to research him for a ninth grade assignment. I learned that he was a well-respected writer for adults when he wrote his children's classics, Stuart Little and Charlotte's Web. When children asked White if his stories were true, he replied, they are make-believe stories, but real life is only one kind of life. There is also the life of the imagination and something dawned on me. If a revered middle-aged man like E.B. White could make believe that a spider named Charlotte saved the life of her best friend Wilbur the pig by writing words in her web, or that a mouse named Stuart Little was born to a human family on New York's Upper East Side, then maybe I had nothing to worry about. E.B. White had never stopped slipping between real and imaginary life, and neither had the other authors and illustrators I loved. Making the connection between the way that, say, Beatrix Potter breathed life into her watercolor rabbit Peter and the way that I animated my own more crudely painted characters made me feel less ashamed about my embarrassing secret. Gradually, to my relief, I did put away my childish things. I didn't go off to college with a suitcase full of paper dolls, but I never stopped needing to make believe. One day when I'd become a teacher, a doodle of a little blue crocodile with rainbow scales popped up onto a lesson plan I was working on. His name was Ernst. He loved to wonder what if. He wished he could get a spaceship for his birthday. His grandma was pink and his mother was purple and his dad was a respectable green. With perseverance, practice, and many rough drafts, he evolved into my early picture book, Ernst. All those years I spent playing in my dollhouse turned out to be great training for my adult work. Caring deeply about creatures made of paper and paint, 
cloth and clay, and piecing together settings for them isn't so different from what I do when I create a picture book with collage illustrations, which are also pieced together from scraps. I've published over 30 books about all kinds of characters, from a dancing deer to a babyish monster to a butterfly with transparent wings. One of my books is about a dog who bakes a giant golden sun out of bread dough when the real sun won't shine. Another is about a gluttonous little gingerbread boy who instead of being eaten tries to gobble up everything else. I seem to like stories about baked goods. <laughs> because my books are on the dreamlike side, it's always a little scary when it's time to send one, a new one off into the real world. Like the mother of a kindergartner on the first day of school, I hope my little creation won't get lost or heard out there. Mostly, though, I hope it will make friends. I'm glad that my books have made so many friends through the years. People in Japan have sent me musical videos of their children baking sun bread. A few young adults have shown me their Ernst tattoos. Recently, a fifth grader wrote me a letter. Dear Elisa Clevin, it begins, a long time ago, your book, The Lion and the Little Red Bird, made me a better person. It showed me that not only people have friendships and feelings, it made me kinder and more nature-loving. The, the long letter ends with this. It may be just a book, but it can change lives. My readers changed my life in powerful ways. Six years ago, a little girl named Ashley made friends with my book, The Paper Princess. Ashley discovered the book at Children's Hospital where she was being treated for leukemia. She connected with the story about a child's handmade paper doll, a princess who blows away before the child can give it hair. Like the paper princess, Ashley was cheerful and brave, yet terribly fragile, beautiful and bald, almost brand new, but facing a perilous, unpredictable journey. With the help of Bay Kids, a nonprofit which gives sick children the chance to make their own films, Ashley decided to make a movie based on the paper princess. She was the star, and her own handmade characters were the supporting cast. A a Bay Kids asked if I would come meet Ashley, and we liked each other so much that we wanted more time together. In the weeks and months to come, Ashley filled her hospital room with artwork, especially paper princesses. She gave each one a story and a name, raspberry, rainbow, sonrisa. Ashley's princesses could do whatever they liked. They swam in the ocean, they jumped over the moon, they partied underneath the stars, they picked strawberries in sunny meadows. Between chemo drips and surgeries, Ashley created an oasis of pure make-believe. I wish I could tell you that Ashley magically vanquished leukemia, but she died when she was only six. Not at all magic. And yet, Ashley and I met because of a paper doll character in a fairy tale. That whimsical paper doll lightened Ashley's darkening world and inspired her own rainbow bright creations. It forged a lasting friendship between Ashley's loving family and my own. And a paper princess like the one in the story keeps Ashley's playful, brilliant spirit company in her final resting place. In some ways, Ashley reminded me of my grandmother, a tiny Ukrainian Jewish woman whose own intense imagination helped her rise above a traumatic reality. Before the Nazi stranglehold in Europe, my grandma and her little sister had escaped to the US, but the rest of their large family and their their entire town was obliterated. A few years later, without any prior training, my grandma picked up some clay and began to carve her loved one's likenesses in it. Out of the clay, her mother emerged, smiling as she brushed her daughter's hair. A little boy held a shaggy dog. A girl cuddled her cat. My grandma continued to work on her art for the rest of her life. Her hundreds of sculptures picked up where their counterparts' real lives had brutally ended. In their tender way, they prevailed over evil. My mother, a printmaker, also used art to resist injustice and violence. When I was seven, I watched her etch a sunflower and some childlike words into a two-inch sheet of metal. My mom said that in such a tiny space, she felt like she needed to make a big statement, and she did. After she donated her piece to the group Another Mother for Peace, P-E-A-C-E, it began to pop up on posters and bumper stickers and on the stationery which thousands of people used to write Congress urging an end to the Vietnam War. It became an icon of the peace movement and has been exhibited in museums from MoMA to the Victoria and Albert. 
In these dangerous times, its simple, quiet truth speaks more urgently than ever. Playful creations can work real magic. A tiny sunflower can solidify resistance to war. A sculpture can help heal grief and recover the lost. A fictional picture book can make a child feel better or feel like a better person. Make-believe characters can make real friends. Einstein stated that imagination is more important than knowledge. When asked how to develop intelligence in young people, he said, read them fairy tales, then read them more fairy tales. Fairy tales and folk tales nourish the imagination. In our tightly scheduled, heavily evaluated culture, children's imaginations need nourishing more than ever. Their growing minds need good stories like their bodies need good food. Their naturally creative spirits need time, space, and freedom to exercise and explore. Whenever I visit schools or teach art classes, the, the persistence of the creative drive amazes me. In spite of the um, technical wizardry all around them, children still love to conjure up new things from simple materials. They love to create their own little worlds within the huge, hard to control world. Making a watercolor river flow and swirl on a hot day or drawing a superhero universe in a notebook gives children a sense of their own unique superpowers as no manufactured toy can. It allows them the abracadabra moments we all deserve. What if we stop thinking that in order to grow up successfully, we must jettison our playful imaginations? Imagine the world we might have if we wove make-believe all through it, throughout our lives. Like children feeling that their teddy bears or bikes, in my case, are living friends. What if we infuse the natural world with a kindred spirit? What if we pretended that everything from bears to, to bees was a friend? What if, like, like children imagining that windblown trees are dancing, what if we imagined that redwoods and rainforests felt joy or sadness? What if we allowed ourselves to consider that the animals we raise for food are individuals, like Wilbur, worthy of humane care? What if we believed that the ocean loved life too? What if we pretended that it loved to dance with the dolphins and the corals and didn't want a bunch of plastic choking it? The world wouldn't come to a crashing halt it's dignified adults made fools. On the contrary, it would be more sustainable. People who respected the earth as a generous, sacred mother lived in harmony with it for thousands of years. Sensitivity isn't sentimentality. Using our powerful imaginations might be one of the most sensible, sophisticated things we can do to heal our endangered planet. Tomorrow's children will also need our children's well-nourished imaginations. They'll need the life-changing books our children will write, the art that will delight and inspire them. They'll need grown-ups with open-hearted, empathetic, childlike imaginations to safeguard their world, making it greener, bluer, full of new rainbows, both painted and real, shining against the darkness. What a future that might be, and nothing short of magic.